Come on, who's ready for the Word of God today? You are the late service, so you should have had a nice sleep. Right, Acts chapter 2. I'd expect that from the early service, but you guys are the late service. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled, so all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're going to jump down to verse 14 of Acts 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Say all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for the incredible text? Thank you so much, Stepha. Today I want to speak to you on the thought, the generational church. The generational church. How powerful was Pentecost Sunday last weekend? How many of you got a touch from God? Um, I heard Pastor Matt ministered so beautifully into that. The Holy Spirit. I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit. He's the third and equal person to the Godhead. What we don't want to be and do at Nations Church is to be Trinitarian by confession, but Trinitarian in practice. What does it mean by that? We don't want to be of those that confess that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are absolutely equal. But when it comes to actually living our Christian life, God the Father, we love Him. He's our Creator. Jesus Christ, we love Him because He's our Savior. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I'm not really sure. And that's how often people would treat this third equal person of the Godhead. Come on, are you out there? How many of you are so grateful for the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives? Amen. We honor Him today. The Holy Spirit is just as real as God the Father and God the Son. See, the thing about the Holy Spirit, this person of the Holy Spirit, is that He often disturbs the religious. You know what I mean? Like He disturbs the religious we, we get comfortable, we're comfortable worshiping God in song. We're comfortable honoring Jesus in song. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit songs, we, can't, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Do we, do we wave our arms? Do we, you know, do we lift it? No, we're not really sure. We're not really sure how to handle the Holy Spirit. But He is a person. And you might be saying today, oh, that, all that Holy Spirit stuff, that's so experiential. Like, I, I want some depth. I've come to church for some depth. What do you mean you want some depth? There's nothing deeper than having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Come on, are you out there? What do you want to do? Just leave Him in the realm of the intellectual? Come on. If all that you do is connect with God at an intellectual level, then you might as well be a philosopher or a historian. Come on, are you out there? We've called to be Christian, Christ in us, the Spirit of God in us. And His desire here in the book of Acts is that all flesh encounter Him. All flesh. That includes you. Are you made of flesh? Yeah. Are you made of flesh? Come on. All flesh experiences power and presence and the full immersion of the Holy Spirit. So here we find ourselves in the book of Acts. And if you want to know the heart of God, then read texts or uh, sections of Scripture where there is a declaration of some kind. There is some kind of declaration that God gives to kind of reveal His hand, to kind of open up to us what His heart is all about. So what is happening here? We see that the Holy Spirit has come as Jesus has described. He's fully immersing the disciples. They're speaking in other tongues. They're moving in the gifts. They're on fire for God. There is no Bible at the time of when this Acts 2 was, was being recorded. The Bible was being written as they were living it out. So there's no you know, there's no scripture for people to argue or squabble about. Or It was literally mayhem. The Jewish community had never seen or experienced anything like it. So after the encounter, Peter had to do some explaining. Yeah. And he said this, look, okay, um, all right, how can I explain this? Look, um, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel about 900 years before. It's actually happening now. These people aren't Aussies. They're not drunk in the middle of the day, okay? They don't drink in the day. Like, we're Jews, all right? We have more decorum than that. That was funnier in the early service. <laughs> Clearly some of you drink in the morning. <laughs> but they're not drunk as you suppose. They're just filled or fully immersed with the Holy Spirit. And he quotes this amazing, he tries to explain what the prophet Joel had been, um, been prophesying for over 900 years. And I love that here is the desire of God's heart is that he pours or there's an outpouring on all flesh. Thank God that the Holy Spirit wasn't just accessible to the people that had Google. 
to the people that were learned or educated or who could read or write. The Holy Spirit is a great leveler. And I think that's why people are inherently disturbed by Him because, because suddenly I, I, I'm at the same level as the tribal people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You mean my, my Christianity is the, is the same as the illiterate people? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know why the Holy Spirit dis- dis- disturbs the West? It's because we can't feel for a change that we're better than anybody else. Thank God the Holy Spirit come on all flesh and then... God reveals His hand by using this phrase, your sons and daughters. Pour out my spirit on all flesh. He didn't just say it for one generation, but on your sons and your daughters. If anyone's ever taught you that the work of the Holy Spirit stopped at the book of Acts after one generation, clearly didn't read the book of Acts. Come on, don't get quiet on me. Hello. Hello. Your sons and daughters is a generational promise that the Holy Spirit encounter is not just for one generation to feel good about itself, but God's desire is that all flesh, all generations encounter the reality of the Holy Spirit. I need a resounding amen from somebody today if you agree with me. There is a sense that all that God is doing in us through His Holy Spirit is passed down to the next generation. There's never been a more pressing time for us in this generation to fight for and sow into future generations experiencing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm all for Christian education. I'm all for scripture teaching in kids. Absolutely, it all plays a part. But if all that we're doing is passing down good Christian moral values to the next generation, then I'm afraid we've missed it. We've got to pass down the encounter with the Holy Spirit to the next generation because they need to experience themselves the reality of God in their lives. There is a war for the formation of the hearts and souls of the next generation, my friend. And it is incumbent on the church today to think about genuine encounters with the Holy Spirit generationally. It's incumbent on us. Every time we come around building our future season, people always say, oh, PK, you always harp on about generations. Like, oh, generation this and giving money to the generations there. and all. See, if we don't steward the next generation and sow into their future faith, their future encounter, their future spiritual formation, I promise you, somebody else will. The world will shape them. TikTok will. YouTube will. Instagram will. Hello, come on. If we don't shape the hearts and minds of the next generation, drag queens will read stories to them and shape their ideology for the future. Do you understand that? We have to pass uh, the the, the promise of the Holy Spirit on to them. Some of you are saying, oh, PK, don't be so dramatic. Don't be so alarmist. Well, label me what you want. But I'm here today to simply awaken in you the urgency of what it is to be a generationally minded church. It's in Scripture. I want to let you in on something. you got to think about this. That the battle to sow into the next generation, it will never end until Christ's return. That is the mandate of the church. If you love God, but your children don't love God, then the faith dies when you die. If you love the house of God, but your kids don't love the house of God, the house of God dies when you die. You know, and here's the thing. When, when, when preaching truth out of Scripture, I always look for evidence in the overall narrative of Scripture. I never pull out just one text. You've got to look at how God speaks to us out of the Bible, how He reveals it or exposes His heart to us. And when I think about the accounts in Scripture, you got to think about the way that God shows His hand throughout the Bible. The Bible constantly speaks in a generational language. Have you thought about that? Deeply personalized, God reveals Himself. There's a, there's, a, there's a rhema word for us in a moment, absolutely. But if you actually zoom out, the Bible always uses generational words. He introduces Himself in the first instance as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, he, he wants to paint you a picture that He's a generational God. And then on, on from there, Jacob's 13 children become the tribes that form after that. The psalmist through then, the next the next pocket of of human history would write poetry and psalms and songs as they passed down the oral tradition. He would say things like, one generation will declare your mighty works to another. And then we unpack the the, the generational prophecies that come through the prophets. And then we, we open scripture and look at the New Testament. It begins with the genealogies. Come on, are you out there? It's generational language. And then we open the, the epistles. We begin to see the way Paul talks to Timothy. He said, Timothy, Timothy, these things that I've taught you, commit these things 
to faithful men who will teach others also for generations. And then he says to Timothy, you know, at your lowest point, when you feel dejected, when you feel like you're low on faith, remember the faith that was stirred up in you by your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lewis. It's a generational. God always speaks a generational language. The evidence is so compelling so that to not live with the generations in mind would actually be to be anti the heart of God. And if you ever wondered why we put it up on the screen, why it's everywhere, what you see it in the things that we print, is because our church is a generational church because God is a generational God. For us to be the imago Dei, the image bearers of God, for us to adequately reflect Him on the earth, we can't live as if all that this Christian journey is for us is to get blessed right now and that's it. We can't live like that. For us to be the image bearers of God, we need to think as if we are not the be-all and end-all that God wants to do so much more in and through us for generations to come. It's one of the core messages of Scripture that God is a generational-minded God. When I think about the way that we read Scripture, we can often apply it at a shallow level. We, have, we call it skin-deep hermeneutics, fingernail deep, right? We apply it immediately just to ourselves, which is great, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to take you a little deeper. We look at texts like Ephesians 3, chapter 20. It's one of the most quoted. It's, it's on quite a few toilet doors, I'm sure. Right? Alongside the Philippians verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's fantastic. Ephesians chapter 3.20, it's amazing. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Yes and amen. We name that and claim that for us when we're trying to sell a house. <laughs> exceedingly abundantly. You know what I mean? Single women, when they have their checklists of men that they want. You know, he's going to be good looking, he has to have abs, he has to be rich, he has to be Christian, speak in tongues, lead worship, preach the gospel, love my kids, love me, awesome. And then he's that exceedingly abundantly sister, and everybody affirms that. <laughs> Fantastic, it's great. It's okay, that kind of hermeneutics is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But can I suggest to you that this text in Ephesians 3.20 does not end with a full stop, it has a comma. It's actually two verses... One sentence, because Paul says, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. The exceedingly abundantly over all that you can ask or think is God wanting to do something beyond your lifetime, beyond what you can conceptualize in the church for all generations. What he's doing now at Nations Church, he wants to do for the nations after that, the generations after that, the nations church of tomorrow, and on and on it goes. God is seeing beyond. And I love that God says, my glory is going to be seen in the church. The church, his bride, is where his glory is best displayed. People often say, oh, you know, the, the, the greatest presence of God is outside of the four walls. It's on the streets. It's with the homeless. I can see why you say that because it appeals to the mercy side of you, but that's not in scripture. God says that my glory is going to be revealed in my bride, my ecclesia, the church. So being a generational church will not stop until Christ's return. And if the church gets it right and the church is generationally strong, generationally intentional, God will reveal His glory for generations forever and ever. Amen. That's God's intention. So when we read Scripture, there is evidence of God using generational language. We also see that God uses accounts in Scripture to describe to us how one generation interacts with another. It's almost like, at times, a cautionary note or a sobering sense as we begin to read how one generation interacts with another, how one generation's behavior affects the next. We see this a lot in 1 and 2 Kings. We see this a lot in 1 and 2 Chronicles, so on and so forth, where it speaks of one king, then his son takes over, becomes king, and then his son takes over. We see the generational movings, uh, ups and downs, the peaks and troughs of the way that, that affected the nation of Israel and their heart towards the Lord. We're going to jump down to one, 2 Kings chapter 18, 2 Kings chapter 18, and it accounts for a man or a king by the name of Hezekiah. We're going to put that slide up. We're going to read together. 2 Kings chapter 18, reading from verse 1, it says, Now it come. It came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old, and he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did 
what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Not his real father, his, his forefather David had done. We don't have time to read all of Hezekiah's story. It is incredibly powerful, however. You, you can probably best describe Hezekiah as a reformer. In 29 years, Israel experienced incredible outpouring of God. Why? Because Hezekiah did things like he destroyed pagan worship, 2 Chronicles 31. You can look that up yourself. He reopened the temple doors and cleanses the temple so worship can be reestablished, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. He reinstated Levitical priesthood, 24-7 worship in the house of God, 2 Chronicles 31. You can see that he reinstated tithing, 2 Chronicles 31, 5 to 10. So the nation experienced great abundance and outpouring. It was very prosperous. He established an entire nation's observance to God's laws. We see 2 Chronicles 31, 20. 29 incredible years under Hezekiah's reign. He was a reformer. He did incredible things. But you know what? For every good thing that Hezekiah achieved, it died with him after one generation. I don't have time to unpack 2 Kings chapter 19 and 20. But as we begin to see, Hezekiah lived a great life as a God-serving, God-loving, God-fearing king. But he did not sow into the next generation. So we come upon his time of his death in 2 Kings chapter 20. And we're going to read from verse 20. It talks about his burial. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah rested with his fathers. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Turn the page over. Verse 1 of 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. So his father reigned 29 Manasseh reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. How on earth does 29 years of God-loving, God-fearing reform be undone in just another generation? As you begin to read about Manasseh's reign, What he did that was heinous before the Lord wasn't the fact that he allowed ungodly things to happen in the streets. What was the most abominable about what Manasseh did was that he opened the house of God to the worship of Baal. He allowed what was ungodly into what was inherently sacred. He defiled the place of worship See, it's almost as if it was a prophetic picture or a cautionary note of what happens when we open the altars of our heart to the ways of the world and the things that should never occupy the space of honor for Jehovah. In Manasseh's rule and reign, he undid every good thing that Hezekiah, his father, did and in fact did much worse than all the good things that Hezekiah did. Make sense to you? He did far worse than the far good things that his predecessor did. It was a cautionary note of what happens when a church decides in their day to not invest in the next generation. As Manasseh's life unfolded, there came a point where he did repent for his backsliddenness and his disobedience, but only, that was only until he got carried away to Babylon as a prisoner, but that's not where it ends. As we begin to see, I also started to unpack what happened to Manasseh after he died. What happened to the next generation? As we begin to see, it's not like the next generation decided, okay, we're going to have to reform again, to bring, rebuild, if you like, a bit like a football team. You're down to the dumps, you rebuild again. It gets worse. We begin to see that the next generation, Manasseh's son, Amon, does far worse than his own father. Here's the thing. I believe that apathy that walks in one generation will run in the next. Any kind of backsliddenness, any kind of openness or suggestion to that which is ungodly that walks in us will run in the next generation. What we tolerate in our day will be normalized in the next. Oh, come on. I need to be preaching to a church today. What we decide is okay today begrudgingly is going to be absolutely desired in the next. Let's read 2 Chronicles 33 verse 20. So Manasseh rested with his father, and they buried him in his own house. Then his son Amon reigned in his place. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Amon sacrificed 
to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Amon trespassed more and more or trespassed even more. Even more. I don't want to harp on about how this, you, you, you get the picture. And some of you might be going, PK, please just stop. I know you're being alarmist now. I'm just trying to awaken in you that being a generational church is a matter of urgency. Being a generational church is a matter of urgency for you and for me. We can't get complacent today about our future as a church because the world will not build the future generations and sow into them like we can. We can't trust the media to. We can't trust the politicians. Come on. We can't trust the public school system to raise our kids the way that God wants us to raise them. And today, as we think about building our future next week, it might look like sacrificial sowing, but why are we doing this? We're doing this so the next generation can be assured of a church that is strong and healthy. For days and years and months to come after we're gone. Can I go a little deeper with you? Manasseh's reign and his life has a bit of a double-sided application. So does Hezekiah's reign. As we begin to look at Hezekiah to Manasseh to Amon, You know, as much as these stories remind us out of the Bible that we can't get complacent about building our future and sowing into future generations, those of you that are 30 years and younger within the sound of my voice in this service, the youth and young adults in the room, you're actually going to be the first generation here at Nations Church to actually be handed significant resource and buildings. This has actually enabled the next generation, your your generation of ministries to grow and flourish. So I want to say this to you, don't get proud and it mustn't stop with you. Revival didn't start because of your awesomeness. It started because of the grace of God and the sacrificial song in the generations that have gone before you to allow you to steward this. So don't allow blessing to corrupt you nor puff you up. You're just a link in the legacy chain. So if you're just a link, don't break. Come on, are you out there? Some of you don't know what it's like to set up and pack down or bump in and bump out because we haven't done that since 2014 here at our Myri campus. Some of you don't know what it's like to not have permanency. Every week, if you wanted to, you could come into the house of God 24-7 and worship and honor God with assurance that that is an indefinite period of time for you now to stand on those, the, the shoulders of those that have gone before you. The encounter is here for generations. If you're here and you're a link, don't break. Hold strong. I'll tell you why. Because the toddlers today in Sprouts and Rockets need you to be generationally minded too. They need you to be generationally minded too. So today, I want you to consider this question. Can you see the generational church? Can you see it? I'm not asking you to look at the natural. I'm asking you to see it. J. Oswald Sanders, the great Christian author, writes this, Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. It's rare. And when you come to church, do you look around and you see, oh, they've got so much, you know, it's a beautiful building. People have actually come to check out our building. Please come and check out God, because that's, that, that's actually going to be better for you. <laughs> the building's great, but God's going to change your life. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? When you look around, you might say, oh, well, you know, it's got everything. It's it looks good. But can you see a generational church? Can you see? We're going to be sowing in because we don't want to hand the next generation debt. Can you see a generational church that is debt-free and unencumbered? Can you see a generational church where we're going to be redoing and increasing capacity in our kids' wing in those areas there because they're at capacity? Can you see? Can you see a generational church? Can you see buildings and permanency and locations in cities we're not at yet? Come on, are you out there? For people we're about to reach. There's more lost, found disciples made in nation's reach. That's what we're going to be sowing into. Can you see a generational church? When, when we talk about this, I want you to catch this, that building our future is about continuing to see a future we're yet to possess. It's continuing to see a future we're yet to possess. And when we so generationally know this, that we are becoming the Imago Dei, the image bearer of God. So the life of Hezekiah passed down to Manasseh, which then has Ammon at the other side of that, is a cautionary note to us. But I want to say to you today at Nations Church, we're going to buck that trend. Yes. We are links in the legacy chain that won't break in our time and in our hour. 
I don't know if you've thought about it, but I'm not going to be your pastor forever. <laughs> you can have me for as long as you like. Could be up to next week. Who knows? <laughs> but we're going to pass all of this on to the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about a generational church, I'm going to bring you back down to the book of Acts. We started with this. It's that beautiful account of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Peter struggled to explain it. He thought, wow, I'm going to talk about the prophecy 900 years before. Pour out my spirit in all flesh, your sons and daughters. Between 2004 and 2014, uh, there, were, there were some of the most, um, um, let's, say, let's say, character-growing times of our church's life. Uh, for five years, we bumped in and bumped out of the Melville Community Center, Melville Civic Center. And then uh, for the five years after that, 20, uh, 2009 to 2014, we bumped in and bumped out out of the most feral basketball stadium you could think of. Um, it was in those seasons where, um, you know, my, uh, we were raising a, a, a typical son and a, a son, son with additional needs, and Jensen has, you know, incredible memories of running around the Melville Civic Center and, and the vault and, and the kids' church area. He also has, you know, some very painful memories of having to walk 400 meters to, to Brentwood Primary School to kind of do his, his own kids' church experience. Throughout those seasons, uh, our own boy, Isaiah, had real, he was, there was nowhere where he could fit. There was no, no particular program that would help him, and it was always a fish out of water. And, you know, here I am being a generationally minded leader, you know, really having that revelation trying to steward that as best as I can the first 10 years of our church's life. And my own son had real no means of having an encounter with God that was real, you know, and there was, there was no facilities for him. Um, and so, you know, until we started to really sow into building our future, we began to purchase our own facilities that we began to have something called Heroes Academy. For you, those of you that don't know what that is, it's the ministry that we now have to minister to children with additional needs and their parents and their families as well. And just, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we built this facility here with its own wing and its own ability for um, kids with additional needs to kind of interface uh, in an intersectional manner with, with uh, typical children. It's just, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's on the other side of the building. It's a beautiful place now. We get now, we get testimonies of what Tobias, giving his heart to the Lord, has been able to come on. And so what it feels like for us, in, in, in my time anyway, is like we've sown the pain of Isaiah's journey for the next generation of kids with additional needs. To experience, so they don't have to experience what Isaiah did. Isaiah's now too old. Yeah. He's never enjoyed Heroes Academy yeah. because he's too old. Yeah. And, you know, as we began to steward that reality, there's a part of me that felt of the pain in, in my heart of God. You know, does my son miss out? It's great now that the next generation gets to experience God, whether they're typical or, or, or not, neurodiverse or not, you know. And so it's great that we've got all of the facilities and all the means and all of the resource to do that now. And we pray that there's many more to come across many different campuses. But what about my own son? Does he miss out? Does he not get to experience you and encounter you in a real way? I mean, is he too old now? Have I missed those early formative years of him being 8, 9, 10, 11 years old where someone comes alongside him with a yellow shirt, works with him, explains Jesus to him? Does he miss out on all of that? How many of you know that God is so kind? He never lets us miss out. Yeah. Last weekend when I was in Queensland, I was ministering with a church. And every time I minister away, I'm torn, you know, very present with the church that's invited me. But my mind's always home with my family and with you guys. You are my first love, right? Um, but at the end of the night, we had, um, I, Chrissy, Chrissy had texted me and, and talked to me about this, this experience, that, this conversation she had with Isaiah. And it was Pentecost Sunday. And, um, you know, like big ups to the junior high team for looking after my boy. Can we just give a big hand to the junior high team? They brought the junior high team into the auditorium. Only my son shouldn't be in junior high because he's year 11. But we call them pastor's privileges, right? So it's, he, it's meant to be year 60, year 9, but we've asked for a couple of extra years of, of grace. We might push it out to year 12 and maybe even year 13 if we can. <laughs> then you can stay in junior high, that'd be great because the leadership's so awesome. Anyhow, they were in the building, this building, that we'd sewn in. And Isaiah, in his nonverbal way, was explaining to Chrissy how the Holy Spirit touched him. Yeah. And Chrissy caught that on camera. And we want to play that to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Cast your eyes on the screen now for this little clip. Tell me what happened tonight. Hello. Mom. Yeah. Water. Water. Uh, From your eyes. Yeah. Water. When you were worshipping. Water. Water was coming out of your eyes. Yeah. It was the Holy Spirit touching your heart. Um. 
in the last days, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters. My son doesn't need to miss out. Your children don't need to miss out. If you're here today and you're thinking maybe, you know, my kids are too old now, they've grown up, or my kids don't follow Jesus, they've, they've gone their own way. You're a spiritual parent, and you should carry the heart of what it is to build the future for the next generation of maybe biological children that aren't your own, but spiritual children that call you spiritual mums and dads. It matters that you're here. It matters that you're in the house of God. It matters that you bring your kids to the house of God. We think the life we live is just for us. Come on. We think we just do stuff to get by that it doesn't matter. Who cares? It matters. It matters that we sow. It matters that you pray. It matters. It matters. On your seats, at this building of future envelopes, and we do this every year. It looks like a giving slip. And yeah, we're going to be giving sacrificially. We have a shared future. So we have a shared responsibility. Yeah. It's going to be different amounts that we give. But our prayer is that it's going to be equal sacrifice. Yeah. Because through the years, so many people have given different amounts, but equally sacrificed so we could be here. Yeah. We have testimonies like what Isaiah gave and Tobias and many others. It can't stop here. I want testimonies like this and more 50 years from now. Yeah. And when we think about the generational church. We are the generational church. We have a shared future, so we have a shared responsibility to sow sacrificially. My prayer for us is that this year we stand up again to be the generational church that He's called us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that helpful to you guys? Can we give God a big shout of praise?